think I've, I've, I've missed a single <laughs> present myself. Uh, I have to thank the organizers too. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not just in case. <laughs> okay, it's all on the on the board. Everybody's ready. So my name is Hugues Chate. So if you can say Hugues correctly, if you're not French, you already win something. <laughs> and so my my main job is at Sierra Saclay. That's almost Paris. Where is yeah Cesare is here. Because his main job is also at Sierra Saclay now. So we are colleagues. And I have a part time job in in China. Um, okay, if you want to talk about China, I'm ready. So I have. You know, here in Saclay, we, you can imagine we have uh, pretty good working conditions, but no money. Here we have excellent working conditions and lots of money. <laughs> Somebody's foolish enough to work in China, come talk to me. Uh, and I also have a third part-time job as the lead editor of Physical Review Letters. So that's for dinner discussions, but I'm, but I'm ready to discuss it. So if you have, you know, if you ever wonder why should anybody publish in the most prestigious journal of physics, <laughs> well, come to me. All right. Um, and you will know about DADAM. And uh, this, this is an acronym that I found last year to give a talk in, in India. And it sounded a little bit uh, Indian, DADAM. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, uh, and I will start with uh, putting myself in, in, in this corner of physics, of active matter even. And... Uh, and that will be the first part of the talk. Then we'll get to more serious issues. And basically, it's divided in two parts. One part today will be mostly uh, microscopic level particle models and a bit of experiments, actually. And the second part tomorrow will be how to derive uh, hydrodynamic descriptions from all these things, for all these cases that I will present today, uh, using kinetic theory kind of things. And uh, some well-behaved uh, closure, which I think is the best, not the one that Michael argued for this morning, but, <laughs> but I will show you how it works. Uh, I can do this uh, because it's relatively simple, even though I will not get into the details of every calculation, of course, uh, given the time I have. And to the right here is a flock of starlings, which have become some kind of landmark for active matter, uh, although, you know, nobody claims to be describing this properly, and uh, it's just uh, emblematic. All right. And before I forget, because I always forget, uh, this is a list of probably most of the people who contributed to, in some part, to what I will say. And uh, so our organizer is here. That's, that's the most important one. <laughs> All right. So it's a collaborative work over the last whatever, you know, it may make, make, make me feel a bit old. No, let's say 10, 15, come on. <laughs> All right. Um, and just to set the very global scale, in case you missed talks about active matter and you just arrived, like Jean-Francois. And uh, okay, what is it we're talking about? So f I want to say a few words about uh, universality, in fact, here first. As you know, statistical physics is about uh, not guessing, but uh, deducting, uh, uh, predicting collective properties from microscopic uh, rules or interactions. Okay, at equilibrium, thermodynamic equilibrium, this is a very developed topic. And one of the successes relies on and some fairly uh, well-defined notion of universality for critical phenomena. You've heard about this, the scaling laws, the scaling functions uh, are all universal, meaning only depend on the space dimension, conservation and symmetries, conservation laws and symmetries, okay? Out of equilibrium, of course, you have none of these hard results. Nevertheless, universality exists, and it's defined as far as I know. There are no exceptions that I know myself, again, by conservation and laws and symmetries, even though some of them might be hidden, more hidden than usual. Okay, so uh, in that context of universality, at least for, for critical behavior or in the sense of renormalization group, uh, and it in the law, in the weaker sense of robustness uh, or, or structural stability of results and equations, like it is sometimes understood in dynamical systems, uh, okay, it's interesting to focus on minimal model. Uh, why? Because they belong to large classes, hopefully, of no, universality classes. 
okay? And because they're minimal, a minimal means if you take something out of them, uh, the physics you want to describe disappears. And of course, we can discuss who has the most minimal model. But anyway, minimal models are simple models. Uh, and hopefully simple enough that you can understand better what's going on. You can simulate them better than a more complicated model. Uh, and that's what I will argue for all along these three hours. I would do mostly very simple models, and they're so simple that we can actually derive rather easily continuous theories from them. Okay. Uh, another part here is different ways of being out of equilibrium. So active matter, as you said, is full, uh, is only about, or mostly about out of equilibrium systems, meaning detailed balance is broken, uh, and other consequences of that. Okay. Now there are different ways of being out of equilibrium, and active matter is, is I would say, one of them. You can be near equilibrium and rely on this proximity to, to develop linear theories. You can go very, very, very slowly to equilibrium, so slowly that you can wonder whether it's a state, a new state of matter that you're looking at before it eventually reaches equilibrium. That's a Typical problems for glass and glassy behavior. You can be maintained out of equilibrium as kind of textbook example by some external field, gradient, force, whatever. Or you can be uh, here genuinely or, or generically out of equilibrium in the bulk. The microscopic units, components of your system are spending energy to do something, and that's a loose definition of active matter. Okay, all right. Now, active matter, I uh, usually, you know, skip this slide, but I decided to put it back, so it happens on all kinds of scales. Basically driven out of equilibrium in the bulk, uh, mostly this energy used at the local level is produced to, to, to displace the units or the units displace other things, so some physical motion, directed motion, uh, in some sense at least, is used. Okay, all scales, and are there, uh, you've seen this already, this is an active pneumatics made of very dense layer of microtubules displaced and arranged by molecular motors, swan sandwiched between air and oil interface, I think. Uh, these are the swarming bacteria, so the, the lamb scales are more, more or less here, the birds, starlings again. Here, you, Olivia described this system, I think, yeah. Yeah, sorry for that. These are shaken granular particles, and uh, these are some of the colloids forming clusters, uh, spontaneously activated colloids which move. And this is something I will show later, uh, using again subcellular components. Uh, why do I show these particular ones? Uh, because I would like to set the stage for DADAM. And so we recently came up with, from here, it's very deformed actually, this cube. Anyway, uh, the problem with the cube, it has only three dimensions, but uh, these are three dimensions of useful here. Uh, you can have, okay, systems which are more or less wet. So all these moving particles, even though even those who are, you know, moving on a substrate like the granular particles, are surrounded by some fluid or are swimming, etc. So normally you should be able, you should think about uh, what's going on with the fluid around surrounding the particles. In some cases, and I will argue, I'll give you some examples, uh, okay, this can be neglected safely. In some other cases, in fact, uh, hydrodynamic interactions, like what we heard this morning, is the only interaction between swimmers in some dilute limit. Uh, so dilute and dense also makes a difference. These are two local uh, basic kind of interactions that come and come again, okay, local alignment or local repulsion, or some mixture of the two. Okay, now, for example, this, the shaken granular media you would argue are very dry, okay? And they certainly uh, are based on repulsive interactions between the particles, leading or not to some alignment. Olivier will show you how, even with spherical particles in this case, actually. And there, of course, uh, neither dilute nor dense, so it can be studied in very dense limit, but uh, Right, you can see, you can put the uh, active colloids in there. It's argued that there is no alignment, it's mostly repulsion, that's why we're at the bottom. It is mostly dry, even though you can argue that maybe the fluid plays a role, and uh, okay. Right, and so on. So the bacteria will be in some region inside here, 
these bacteria are sandwiched in 2D. There's a lot of momentum exchange with the boundaries, so it's not fully wet. Uh, it's not fully dry, of course, either. It's dense or not so dense. And again, here you see that locally you have some degree of alignment arising from steric interactions, so it's a mixture of everything. Okay, now datum is right here. And that's the set of measure zero. You say, okay, well, I'll spend three hours on this, but anyway, <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> what can I say? MIPS is also a set of measure zero. Uh, we could argue, it's but it's a slightly larger set of measure zero. <laughs> okay. Uh, of course, three dimensions are not enough. You know, for example, if you think about uh, swimmers that actually also uh, so interact via hydrodynamic interactions, but also locally aligned things like that, you, you would not be able to put everything in this cube. So that's just for convenience. This is to say that indeed we are. I'm going to talk mostly uh, only about this. This limit of strictly dry, uh, dilute in the large sense. I'll come back to this later and uh, strictly al aligning, where alignment is put in, not does not result from steric hindrance. Uh, so th this is obviously a limit case, and you might wonder whether this limit case of zero measure has any experimental relevance. I would argue that there is some, although that's not the point. The point is to, s is to study limit cases which are of interest, I believe, uh, if you claim to be describing anything realistic in the middle of this cube or elsewhere. Okay. Um, okay. So I said some of this already. So are uh, the two limit cases so the the that I'm and uh, MIPS as at least MIPS with active rounding particles that I can put on this cube are arguably the two most advanced uh, cases because they're simplest because they started earlier early um, because it's dry physically easier and so on. Okay. And uh, it started for Dadam at least, so strict alignment only in 1995, as I will show soon. Uh, and it was under the guise of the problem of collective motion. How do I have a simple minim minimal model for things to move together? Okay, and that's what Vikshak and collaborators did that year. Okay, the Vikshak model, and well I will spend some time on this, uh, is defined by this sentence. You have point particles in some space moving at constant speed. Okay, speed is constant, velocity is not. What's the direction of motion? The direction of motion is the local average of the velocities of whoever is in some neighborhood. If there is nobody, it is my current direction, plus some noise. So if the noise is very strong, it wipes out all the interactions and you have random, more or less persistent random walkers. If the noise is weak, or the density of particles in the box is large enough, you may have collective motion. That's you know already something important about the Vickshack model. All right. Now, in this context, collective motion appears as spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, it's not collective motion, you know, following a leader uh, guided by an external field or by the walls of some, you know, box or some aquarium or whatever. And that I'm again is the limit case of some experimental relevance, but that's not really the main important thing. So today, I will start actually with one experiment that I like because uh, my name is on the paper that uh, relates it. No, it's uh, seriously, it's a, it's a nice experiment in which I'm fully convinced myself that it is a dry system where the main interaction is by far alignment. Of course, there is noise and it leads to interesting collective phenomena. I uh, hopefully won't spend too much time on this unless there are questions. And then I will go through the phenomenology of the three basic classes for of Vikshak style models or datum classes that we can define depending on the symmetries of the interaction, mostly alignment. Okay. And tomorrow I will go beyond uh, basically numerical simulations of these things and derive and analyze uh, hydrodynamic equations for these three clas classes. And if I have more time, I will tell you uh, about some new work about the fourth class, if you want. Okay. All right. Which we call Big Shack Shake. It is. It's very hard to say. <laughs> okay. Motility essays. So we've already seen some slides. Motility essays were have been devised, uh, designed by a biologist to study uh, single motor, molecular motor uh, motion. So you 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 stick the motor to some substrate. 
you put some filament to something and that's moved by the motor and it moves more or less in 2D so it's easy to image by fluorescence. Here it is used, the same system, uh, you see from above here, you don't see the motors. It's a very, very dense, denser than usual carpet of motors with the active heads which grab the filaments of the presence of ATP uh, collectively. Here, the filaments that you see moving are microtubules and not actin filaments that were presented yesterday. They're more rigid, they're thicker, uh, and here they're moved by dynine dining C motors in this case, okay? Uh, you can see some events of alignment in this sparse. This is a very dense density of motors, but not so many microtubules as you can see, and nothing collective is really emerging here, okay? Uh, one thing remarkable that's actually hard to understand or model is how, you know, typically hundreds of motors attach at a given time in pushing on a microtubule in various directions in particular are able to move really the microtubule at some more or less constant speed, some smooth, almost reptation-like motion. Okay, that's a fact that you can see here. They move pretty constant speed and, and it's a very smooth motion. All right, there are some fluctuations, but they are on very large scales. Okay, how does this happen microscopically? Uh, um, my according to me, it's not obvious. Okay, now what we have done or what rather Professor Oiwa and other Japanese colleagues have done is to look at what happens. So they were interested in this, you know, as a function of the density of motors, uh, what is the typical speed? Uh, almost like Formula One. <laughs> okay, so we decided to dump whatever microtubules have been prepared. These microtubules are stabilized by taxo, some chemical, etc. very bad for you. Yes? Yes, this is in 2D. This is a, well, I'll show you some statistics about collisions. Depending on the motors, how you prepare the motility assay, you'll see this. You have more or less collisions, but uh, I, I'll show you next collision statistics the next slide. Okay, and so next slide indeed is is just that. Here you have typical events of binary col binary uh, collisions. In fact, with these dining C motors, which are relatively short head, the the well very short length, the the active head lies at fairly well defined uh, distance from the substrates. So much so such that the microtubules are almost always very nicely at the same height in this above the glass substrate here all right so it's really really 2d and there's so much 2d that then they meet they often just bump into each other here you have at the top row and some encounter when the two microtubules that are going to meet meet at some acute angle and you see that they align and continue together for some time these are different times okay gives you an idea of the, f of the speed the speed is about well, some microns per second. You know, the typical length here is five to ten microns of these things. Okay, uh, when they come in together at some obtuse angle, larger than pi over two, they often anti-align and go away from each other exactly opposite directions. Okay, and when they come at some r near right angle, they often stop or cross. Okay, the statistics. Um, the probability of alignment as a function of incoming angle here. So here, uh, it's it's complete, uh, very high probability uh, alignment at up to at ag acute angles. And here in dashed line, uh, it's more more or less symmetric actually for this anti-alignment for up to this angle. And the middle of the yellow that you don't see very well is about the intermediate cases. Basically, yes. Yeah, well, it's we we don't have a resolution to see exactly what's going. Often they actually wait. No. The, w the one that's bumping into the other 
it stops and the other passes and then okay I go uh, and I think there's a distinction between the yellow and the dash what I don't remember my point here is it's almost perfectly symmetric what we call nematic alignment okay we'll come back later to this uh, this is number of observations yeah okay it's done on a few hundred events selected by some poor student no some software sorry automatically <laughs> some human interface attached to it uh, okay so we have constant speed motion okay uh, fairly you see that the stochastic component is not on the orientation you can see it from a movie of a moving uh, the previous movie actually if it wants to start again uh, there is some stochasticity but it's not really on the orientation of microtubules it is rather uh, on the angular velocity that the stochastic component so this is very well modeled by some onstein ullenbeck process acting on the angular velocity, the speed being fixed. All right? So that's the difference with a Vickshack model where the noise is simply put at in some overdamped first order dynamics on the orientation of its particles. All right? Alignment is nematic. And what happens when you put now many, many, many microtubules? So this is uh, the pride of uh, Oiwa sensei. Uh, this, as you see, is several millimeters now. That is, that are imaged by different stage moving uh, fancy microscopy. So, usually conventional motility assays used for studying single motor or single filament properties are small like this. And of course, something nice is going to happen. I, I had decided that this movie would start automatically, but it doesn't want to. So, so here by fluorescence, and this is, uh, I think it's like sped up like 100 times, I don't remember. You see the formation, spontaneous formation of very large vortical structures, about, you know, 500, 400 m micrometers. I remind you that the objects are 5 to 10 micrometers, each of them. So you don't see, here you have millions and millions of them. You cannot see one, of course. Um, and that lasts as long as there is ATP in the system or uh, the boundaries do not actually accumulate uh, too, too many of these things. If you, and the circuit, so what you see here, uh, 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 well you don't see, but you will see now, this is a corner of one of these vortices. So the scale now is uh, 20 microns here. Some uh, microtubules have been marked m better by fluorescence than others, and you can see individual ones now moving in both directions, clockwise and counterclockwise, so there's a pneumatic alignment and circulation which is spontaneously self-segregated okay mm. all right now i will not show this to you but this can be modeled by some big check style model that i will describe later with the additional ingredient compared to the standard cases i will describe that you need some persistence in the motion of a single particle all right so basically here uh, the fluid in which all this is happening can be safely neglected. The microtubules are tightly attached. The, the main interaction is really uh, when they bump into each other. And there is, of course, some stochasticity in the process. Okay. So that's one good experimental example of alignment versus noise, I would claim. White blobs. Ah, some defect in the experiment some bubble or something. <laughs> well, you see uh, in this, in the paper that actually published with this, which does not contain such a large area, uh, you see they were, it's really, it was a little bit more artisanal. They had like bubbles and defects that you could see very well here. I think let's run this again and see whether these are fixed uh, problems, I think. Yeah, these are probably some defects still in the experiment, but uh, it's hard to control. Already this is quite some achievement. So this is the whole film. That this can last, you know, an hour or two. Yes. No, they're not. They're not, they're not. You have, no, in this particular case, uh, we measured from data like this, uh, clockwise versus, versus counterclockwise. There's a bias for, I will never remember which one, Co let's say clockwise, about 55 to 45 percent. Yeah. 
well now you have pneumatic alignment what you have locally is pneumatic order it is biased by a weak bias in the walk of a single tubule if you look at the walk of a single tubule it's a smooth walk and you can study the statistics of say curvature and you will see that it's more or less a Gaussian hence the einstein ullenbeck uh, process but that Gaussian is slightly off center by typically a couple percent of its root mean square. So, and that's due, we believe, to the way the motor is actually grabbing uh, these filaments, which are chiral. So they all move, turning in some, and that introduces a very slight bias. Now we have evidence that if we change the motor, and depending on the type of microtubules, uh, in, in fact, there exist many types of microtubules, as you know, Jean-Francois, I'm sure. Uh, these statistics of local chirality, individual chirality, changes quite a bit. Actually, is able to change also, to some extent, the collective behavior. But of course, I won't get into this. So there is mostly pneumatic. We have another motor, I'm not sure which one, some other dynein, I think, which is almost perfectly symmetric. It gives 50-50. Yes, they are doing this. They are doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I want you to say is see is that itself, with no particular attractive forces between objects, they align pneumatically and they spontaneously segregate into low high density, pneumatically ordered regions in which along which they stream. There's no run and tumble here, it's just polar motion. Okay. Now I'll come back to this later. I mean this should help me present uh, one of the cases. Right. A brief history. In 1995, what did Vicek do? He introduced his model. This is one way of writing it. At discrete time steps, you can also have continuous time. doesn't matter. In some first order in time dynamics, or over damped suitably for all these, most of these systems, you move at constant speed V0 uh, along some direction theta i. This direction theta i is just the average of, of the whoever is the neighborhood. The neighborhood is some in 2D or whatever, a disk of radius one. Uh, you calculate the average uh, direction of whoever is inside, including the, the particle I here. Okay, you take the angle. That's a new direction. Okay, and you add some random angle with some amplitude. So if the noise amplitude is very large, it it overcomes this, of course, and you basically have random walkers. Okay, uh, this is some kind of Ising model for collective motion. Uh, of course, it would be foolish to claim that is re representing any collectively moving system, but it's uh, nice to understand what it's doing before going to more complicated situations again. Uh, this is something I already said. Uh, the advantage of having simple models is that you can derive continuous theories. I will do this. And also you can study them properly numerically so that when you derive theories, you do what you should always do compared to what the microscopic model you started from is doing. Okay. And that's what we will do later. Okay. Uh, so in 1995, it was a bit like this. This is a cartoon. Now, uh, at low density or strong noise, you have, you don't see the, maybe you see the little arrows there all over the place. Okay. No collective motion, no orientational order of long range. If the density is high enough or the noise intensity weak enough, then spontaneously uh, here on periodic boundary conditions, the most of the guys will choose spontaneously one direction out of many. Very often they will like to go along the, boxes, the sides of the periodic box. And this is a weak effect uh, of, the of the boundary conditions, but uh, they actually turn, it turns globally. Okay. So that's spontaneous symmetry breaking here that happened in between. And what Vicek did is a bunch of simulations, say between this and this, actually varying mostly the noise in some smallish size system, find some continuous emergence of global order. You measure this by measuring the mean orientation of all the little vectors here. You take the sum of all the little vectors, okay, normalize the number of vectors, take the norm. That's the scalar between zero and one. Uh, if you take only the polarity of each. Uh, that scalar between 0 and 1 is the order parameter. Here is 0 up to statistical fluctuations. Here it is of order 1. 
not quite one, of course, because it's still fluctuating, of course. And in between, it, you go from zero to one, increasing, say, the noise level, uh, decreasing the noise level, <laughs> sorry, okay? And if you don't pay too much attention, you go there continuously. In fact, what happens in between this and this, if you have a large enough system, or you pay more attention than you would expect uh, naively, you see, you may see something like this. Okay, this is this in some intermediate regime. You will see that all the particles here have uh, gathered spontaneously onto a single, in this case, uh, band, high density, uh, fairly large order inside the band, orientational order, and so the whole thing is moving to the right here leaving behind and, a front and, a, and in front, recruiting in the front sparse particles forming a gas and leaving in the back the same amount of particles statistically in a gas. Okay. Now, the order parameter curves say here at fixed density varying the noise intensity. If you have a smallish system, uh, you see a continuous variation for something which goes near to one at zero noise. Uh, to something which goes to near zero or at large noise. Okay, and if you see already, if you do clean numerics and you see a slightly larger system, you already see that here something happens. Okay, actually with this curve for a finite system uh, will be t typically discontinuous. Yes. Here, uh, it depends. You know, I show you a phase diagram, you know. So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> everything is over door, over door one, you know. So, uh, so here, you know, for example, the noise would be uh, this noise. This noise value would be around here. These points certainly. These three points certainly have a band. These ones I really don't remember. This is a very old graph, but you understand better. It's a layer. There are two main parameters. They will come to this very soon, uh, as I said already, without showing it. The global density of particles and the noise, str the noise strength. The noise is high or the density of particle low, then you're disordered. The noise is low or the density and or the density of particle high, you are ordered. In between, uh, in this plane, you have a line. And this line is actually a thickish region where you see both things. Okay. Now, also in 95, uh, John Toner, who will be here later, and some of his work I mean, I'm not going to uh, explain his work, and I'm pretty sure he will do it very well. Um, but I have to say what he, he has done to, together with Uri Tu, then at IBM together. Vikshak comes to give a seminar about the Vikshak model. He's under review at some famous physics journal. And, um, okay, they sort of believe it, but then they're puzzled because for them, from their viewpoint, this is an XY model. Uh, where the spins are, okay, forced to move at constant speed, but basically locally aligned, locally aligning ferromagnetically in the Vickshack model, competing with some noise, the temperature, you know, it's basically X, Y, so 2D cannot have long range order. So that puzzled them. Uh, actually, if you read the 95 paper by Vickshack at et al., uh, curiously, it is hardly said anywhere that there is true long range order. And the reason I'm told is he did not want to bring that up because he was afraid the referee might reject the paper. <laughs> so, so in the published version, there is actually almost no, mer no mention to this key fact. You have a transition to what? Well, to true long range order as proven almost the same year by uh, John Turner and Uri too. They came back, they wrote down some from the top of their head, I'll come back to this later, some hydrodynamic-like equations. This is almost a Navier-Stokes equation. You see, this is, you should be familiar. This is other ways of advecting or composing, you know, two Vs and one grad that are allowed because you don't have the same symmetries and conservation laws as, as uh, Navier-Stokes. This is a 5-4 ginsburg landau potential setting the non-equilibrium is the speed of individual particles, if you want, and some anisotropic diffusion and some pressure. Okay, something classic. Then they analyze this by RG, so-called dynamic RG, and I bet John will explain this. And they concluded that 
there is indeed the possibility for true long range order in such a system. Okay, that's uh, still now a hard result. Uh, one of the very few hard results we have at the fluctuating level. It's very nice. So indeed, in Vikshak was right, even though he wouldn't say it is, there is true long range order. Now, if you, if you do simulations of Vikshak and you want to check that there is true long range order, that's easy. You take, you know, same density and same noise level and in the ordered phase and you increase system size. You measure the order parameter. You plot this versus the system size in log log and it should go, it will go uh, slower than a power law which is a sign of true long range order, converging to some finite value at this asymptotic uh, infinite size limit. Okay, now what John Toner and Uriah too did not do is study the transition. So Vikshak's paper is about the transition, not saying anything about the ordered phase. And, and uh, Toner two calculation is about the stability of the ordered phase, which they assume to be a homogeneous ordered phase not the traveling bands that I actually described with respect to fluctuations. Okay, so that you will hear the fourth week, I'm pretty sure, along with variations on the theme by John himself. Okay, so, okay, I'll come back to some of the remarks that are here. Now, they also made, so this is uh, how the form under which you can derive the Toner 2 equation, and we'll do this uh, tomorrow. It's slightly slim simpler. You here there is no positional diffusion. Uh, well, there's only this, this effective diffusion here term. Uh, the pressure is reduced to grad rho. Uh, you have indeed the uh, ginsburg landau part and one, two uh, advection terms. It's a slightly simpler, but it's really the same equation up to details. That, okay. Now, they made some predictions, at least at the qualitative level. They study the two-point correlation function in space-time and the generic in, so setting themselves in the ordered phase, supposing it's there's a regime of parameters corresponding to this, doing this RG thing, and they predicted that you would have generically uh, long-range algebraically decaying correlations in space and time, spontaneously. Uh, which you can measure if you really measure the two-point correlation function. Something easier to measure is something that Olivier has mentioned, so-called giant number fluctuations, where one consequence of this calculation, so anisotropic scaling of a two-point correlation function, one consequence of this is that the number fluctuations locally, so the number of particles in a box, in a sub-box inside your system, uh, containing on average n particles, uh, you can measure this signal in time. It fluctuates around the mean value n for a given box size. Uh, the variance will go faster than, in these cases, generically faster than the mean, meaning uh, the root mean square uh, will go faster than square root of n, meaning the law of large numbers does not apply, meaning there are long range correlations. Indeed, you know, all this is connected. Uh, so that's fairly easy to measure experimentally because you just have to count particles or something inside boxes of various sizes. So it's been that's become a favorite experimentally or also numerically. Another consequence of the Toner 2 calculation is that if you take two particles uh, next to each other, or even a single particle, but it's better to here to do it with two particles. So you, you follow, uh, you look at particles in the moving frame. So you're in the ordered phase, everybody moves. Uh, there is a well-defined average velocity. You move in this frame, so particles diffuse around you, but in the transverse directions to the mean motion, the diffusion will not be simple diffusion, it will be super diffusion with some, meaning the, you know, here the distance between two initially closed by particles with diverge with some power law, which is not given just by Brownian motion, okay? And this is some um, proof of it, numerical proof of it. Now. They also went as far as predicting uh, exact values for scaling exponents. They are not so exact anymore, and we will probably tell you why. Uh, in fact, uh, indeed, they are not exact. We, we did recently some serious measurements, and we find the value of exponents different, but that doesn't, doesn't matter. The qualitative framework that they set in 1995 is really uh, valid. Okay, that's the main message here. Okay. Uh, so that's 1995. 19 98, whatever, and then the thing went dormant. Actually, the first few years, not much happened. Um, now, 
uh, we call this DADAM. So uh, in fact, it will be under the guise of mostly two-dimensional Vikshak style model. And you can define basically three classes depending on the symmetry of the alignment. So either ferromagnetic alignment like in the Vikshak model, you just take the sum of the little elementary vectors locally. Or nematic alignment, which I will not write a formula for, but amounting to what you saw for the microtubules meeting each other. At if they come at some obtuse angle, they entire align basically. Okay. So that's two ways of aligning, ferromagnetic and nematic alignment. Local ferromagnetic alignment will produce, may produce global polar order with everybody moving together. Local nematic alignment may produce global nematic order where at a, any given time 50-50% of the population is going one way and the other 50% the other way. Now the motion of individual particles when alone can be just polar motion so no velocity reversals or it could be so-called apolar motion meaning with some finite velocity reversal rate may maybe f fast rate okay and that defines three classes. So basically we are in the framework of point particles, so no repulsion, no attraction of course, no nothing, just local alignment, constant speed, polarity is velocity. Uh, that's a strong <laughs> simplification. Any realistic particle as mentioned by Olivier, active particle has an intrinsic built-in polarity, but its, current its velocity at any point need not be along if it's actually along the polarity. Whereas here, you know, these particles are point-wise, their velocity is their polarity. That's a strong big shack simplification, if you like. Okay. So three classes that I will show next. They are here. Uh, okay, so polar motion, no velocity reversals. Ferromagnetic alignment, that's a big shack model. Uh, apolar motion with some velocity reversals. And pneumatic alignment, that's what we call active pneumatics. Of course, dry here, dry active pneumatics. Polar motion no velocity reversals. The pneumatic alignment, like the microtubules, is some caricature of self-propelled rods, uh, elongated objects moving polarly. When they meet, they align or entire line, like the microtubules do on these motivities that I showed you. Okay, three classes. Uh, there's a fourth class missing here, the case where you have apolar motion and ferromagnetic alignment. If you align the current velocities ferromagnetically, because these velocities are reversed at finite rate, this certainly cannot produce any global orientational order. So the fourth class I will talk about at the end, if I reach that, breaks this uh, assumption here that polarity is given by velocity. And then you can define a fourth class. All right. So we're within this fairly restrictive, restrictive self-imposed Vikshak framework, you can only define three classes, okay? I mean, and then you have to check whether at fluctuating level, collective fluctuating lev level, these are really three classes, and I will come to this point later. Okay, state of the art. So at the beginning, from Vikshak and so on, and Toner 2, this was presented as some, you know, order disorder phase transitions, like in a magnetic system, you measure some magnetization, and it goes continuously from zero to one and so on. Okay, now we know, and, and it started with the uh, 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 appearance of a detection of these uh, traveling bands that I showed you, we know that the, the right framework, at least at the qualitative level, is, is a liquid gas phase separation between a disordered gas, you've seen the disordered gas, an ordered, globally ordered liquid, and in between a coexistence phase made of bits of liquid moving in the gas. But I'll show this later. And this actually was first shown for the so-called active Ising model by Solon and Tyre. And that's really what, this is what unlocked this new view, or I would say the right view of the problem. Okay. And so all models you could think of where alignment is a dominating interaction and you're not too dense and you're know, competing alignment with noise, with given self-propulsion, you know, will be described by one of these three classes, I would agree. Okay. And the physical mechanism that is uh, the origin of this scenario, the separation into a coexistence phase and so on, is, and I'll come back to this several times, 
is a feedback mechanism between order, local order and local density. Suppose I'm particularly dense for some fluctuating reason, fluctuation. I will order rather strongly because I have many neighbors. Uh, if I'm very ordered, I will move more coherently as, as a little packet. Okay, recruiting guys as I move into a packet and with density and order will keep increasing in some feedback loop. This cannot go on forever, of course, there are some nonlinearities counteracting this, but at some linear level, uh, this is really this feedback between local density and local order that distinguishes uh, all these systems. Okay, now, here it is, a phase diagram, schematically. Low global density of particles, strength of noise, the noise is large, or the density not too large, uh, I'm in a gas phase, okay, particles random walk around, more or less persistently. If I'm dense enough, or the noise is weak enough, I have in, I'm in this ordered or quasi-ordered long-range orientational order liquid. So for the Vicek model, it's really everything moving together. With these long-range correlations, anomalous fluctuations and all that built in, everywhere inside this, this super diffusion, for example, is something that excites uh, animal behavior people. Here you have super diffusion for free without putting in your model any long range explicit correlations or little engine in the bird's head that generates power loss, you know. Okay, and in between, uh, the phase coexistence region, phase separated region, in which bits of the ordered liquid stand or move in the gas. So instead of having one single line marking a continuous transition from disorder to order XY model style, you have a whole region where things happen and two transitions. Okay, did I say everything? Yeah, usually in equilibrium systems or phase separation scenario, you would have you know, a parabola here mm -hmm. with a critical point at the top of a parabola. Here for... Uh, deep reasons of symmetry, the critical point you might argue is sent to infinity, infinite density, because the gas and the liquid do not have the same symmetry. The liquid is ordered, orientationally ordered, whereas the gas is disordered. Okay. Now I will show that the same global picture tomorrow is true at the hydrodynamic level and kinetic level and whatever. All right, so that's, that's for all three cases, three classes, yes? Uh, depends what you call this. I would say at finite size, it is a discontinuous variation of the order parameter on both sides. Uh, as I will argue uh, actually in a few moments, if you can wait for a few moments, these are actually two in the asymptotic limit of infinite size. These are two continuous but not critical transitions. Yes, so it's a bit of a... Yes. So I will not call it a first order transition like Olivier did yesterday, but you know, in practice for finite system, it is a discontinuous jump of the order parameter. If you take this as a definition of first order transition, fine. Okay, so, okay, so that's valid for all three classes and we'll see this in detail today, unless I'm dragging my feet, actually maybe not. Um, <coughs> but there are differences. I already said that depending on the symmetry of alignment, you get global polar or nematic order. Uh, the long-range order in the liquid phase can be true long-range order or only quasi-long-range order, and I will show this later. Uh, the coexistence can be phase, phase separation or so-called microphase separation, and, so on. and we're going to see this now at three levels, okay, I'll proceed. Um, yes, so this is what's left. Uh, that's for tomorrow, hopefully, and that's for today. Let me proceed. Okay, now the Vicek model. I'll, I will speed up a bit because I see time is running up. Uh, it's very simple. It's very easy to simulate. Uh, although to get to the asymptotic uh, answer, you need fairly large computer or and an, an, an a good program. So it's nothing. It looks innocently simple, but uh, okay. Right. Finally, a phase diagram, a real one from simulations uh, at fairly large sizes, so these lines are more or less asymptotic. 
here is uh, gas to uh, there's this band phase, the microphase separation, the coexistence phase, and here's the liquid. You see that these two lines actually are well separated in this case, and they at, at very large densities they should converge and meet each other at infinity, and they go to zero, zero to the origin actually together also. Okay, uh, true long range order here as proven by Turner and two microphase separation. I will show you in a minute. Actually here. This is, so focus first on the liquid here, I want something I want to show you. This is, uh, in the liquid phase, a profile of density, and the, the order is currently going along this axis, the x-axis here, and these quantities in red and, and black have been averaged along the transversal dimension here, this is 2D, okay? And the red is a profile of order parameters, so I take over in a slice, uh, you know, x and the x plus the x in a slice here over the whole y extension, I av average the orientations of all particles and normalize properly something between zero and one. Uh, it's very near one, so it's very ordered, as you see here, you know, num point 0.9 something, okay? And the black signal here, the black trace, is also an y average of density, number density. And you see that even though order is well-defined and, and very strong, and hardly fluctuating in X here, the density is fluctuating widely. This is a trace of the giant number fluctuations, and this is a measure of them. That uh, again sh shows an exponent more or less in agreement to the predictions of Turner two, but uh, I don't want to get into this. Now the coexistence phase. This is these are the same profiles, so to speak, in the coexistence phase for a large system, where you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bands. You see that there's order and dense bands coexist, uh, separated by some disordered, essentially disordered and, and sparse regions. Okay, I'll show you a movie next. And this is across, uh, I forget about it. So a very large system for very long times, looking at coarse grain density, one frame every 10,000 time steps, so it's not a movie really here, proboscopically movie. You eventually reach a nicely arranged, smectic arrangement of these bands. You see compression modes. Um, i run it again because it's not too long. You see at some point they adjust their positions and so on. And I'm sure some of you in the audience have heard me say the contrary some, some years ago. <laughs> because to see this, it really takes millions of particles and millions of time steps. And if you have no good reason to go there, you, you don't see it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, the un short answer is no, not really. Uh, there is, but the oh yeah, first answer, there is one lamp scale at fixed parameters, density, noise, etc. There is one lamp scale asymptotically well defined as we can measure it. What sets this lamp scale is actually a pending problem that I will mention at the end. Yeah. Okay, this is to show that it is really like phase separation, micro phase separation. Here are two systems. Same profiles of density here, I density, yes. Yeah, density. Um, for systems with different global density, but the same noise level, okay? So if, if I have normal liquid gas phase separation, I increase the density in my system. In the coexistence phase, I first see a liquid droplet, and this droplet, this liquid part, will take, you know, continuously more and more space in the system until it covers entirely the system. Here it occurs in some discretized quantum quantized version. You see two systems with different global densities at the same noise level. You see first that the noise level, the gas density here is at least in this. Uh, so this is in some instantaneous profiles. These are averaged properly and rescaled. You see here that the gas level is exactly the same. Okay, And you have here more you have populated the liquid by more of these quantized bands. Uh, six here, uh, six versus two. If you put these two objects, you move them, you average over time properly, and you move them on top of each other, it's exactly the same object. And then the number of objects as a function of system size or global density varies linearly. So that's this quantization, but the usual behavior for liquid gas phase separation. So micro phase separation for this.
So the microphase. Um, so one thing that is not known, it is the robustness and stability and whatever of along the band. And so we've done some ridiculously long simulations studying you know, a one band, but we, we choose one band and we choose a system size that is ideal because we know exactly the, the right wavelength. Okay, so we have one band. And they have this interface that, and you say, okay, we take larger and larger and then you multiply and you, and you say, oh, this is a roughening, you know, this is a fluctuating interface, is it KPZ? Well, the answer is no, it seems to be more, uh, not quite smooth. I mean, we, we can't say whether it's a log or if it's a power law, but it, it's, 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 a, it's a much smaller power law than the KPZ roughening exponent. So already this is indication that the super diffusion along the band is acting and does something interesting. So that data we never published. We want to come back to this. And now when we have several of them, they interact. And indeed, something must happen, some defects in this magnetic. So what, what we believe, what John believes for sure, is that the orientational order will resist breakdown of the smectic order. But how the smectic order breaks down and so on. Uh, we have some work on very simple model for active smectics, and they show very fascinating large-scale stuff organized around defect. <laughs> so I'm not sure, but nobody dared oh, to go <laughs> as far. You know. So what is well known is what happens if you have large systems and also hydro hydrodynamically it's the same situation uh, along the direction of motion. Transversely, nobody ever did anything serious, either microscopically or hydrodynamically. So it's pending. So it's a good question. <laughs> Ah, in the microtubules, ah, yeah. Uh, the there is a well-defined average curvature, if you want, or mean curvature. Uh, this is a smooth, you know, the persistence of a walk. Yeah. If I take the Vickshack model and I don't have, you know, uh, self-diffusion for the noise is not acting directly on theta, but it's acting on in a finite, in a continuous time Vickshack model, acting on theta dot like in an orstein ullenbeck process, and I have a smooth walk for an individual guy, that big check model with memory, if you want to call it this way, is able very easily to produce all these very nice vortices and whatever. Okay. So this is what I did in this paper published in the magazine. But it's, it's alignment versus noise, but there's also a little bit of you know, the smooth walk. It's an extra ingredient for the microtubules because of the many, many motors moving the tubule, any tube, let's say. Okay, now about the transitions. There are two transitions. Each of them are is continuous, but not critical, in the sense that, you know, what sets in a finite scale, what sets the final jump of the order parameter is the fact that you go from one last remaining band to zero band. Now, if your system is huge and there's a tiny, lonely, single band in there, which has finite width, the weight that band carries for the typical order parameter uh, is zero. And so it's a continuous. The order parameter curve goes continuously to zero. If your system is super, super large, there's actually a but finite. There's a small jump that you will, you know. So uh, what is there? Yeah, so local density and order, things get together into localized, dense, ordered structures, thanks to the feedback mechanism that I mentioned. Okay, uh, I don't want to go into this much. I will skip through this. I'll show you a movie. It's a very old movie we, we did with large systems. This sh so I start from random everything in the ordered phase, in the band phase actually here. You see that order grows very fast and so forth. It's very nice. You can study this a little bit more seriously than a movie and, and have a two-point correlation function at different times. Here in log log, you see that these are weird functions. They have more or less a kind of parallel-ish region here with varying exponent. So we don't know exactly what it is. They do have an exponentially an exponential cutoff. And if you use this cutoff as a definition of lamp scale, it does not collapse all the correlation functions. 
to rescale by this correlation length. But this lamp scale, or this exponential cutoff scale, grows linearly in time. So that's very fast domain growth, but it's not a classic case. Uh, it's just a little bit. For those of you who know these problems, that's worth also studying seriously. Now, uh, quickly, the ne active pneumatics. So here, a polar particles, finite velocity reversal rate, and pneumatic alignment, all right? Uh, here's a true phase diagram. It looks, it's, a s it's uh, on com comparable scales, probably it's a uh, smaller coexistence region. In this region, so here you have a quasi-long range ordered pneumatic, uh, globally pneumatic phase. Quasi-long range order means log of order parameter versus log system size decays as a parallel. So asymptotically there's no order, but it's a small decay. Okay, here's the gas, here the liquid, and here the coexistence phase. In the gas, you have a giant number of operations with more or less the same exponent. Okay, and the coexistence phase looks like this. In a small system, you have uh, all the particles in a dense, pneumatically ordered band and leaving a sort of a gas disordered region here. This thing can reorganize itself actually even in a small system very fast. In a very large system, on a very large time, this is a very expensive movie. Uh, some decades of CPU probably, uh, and it's not long enough because you see it's still more or less globally ordered, but in fact, we believe and we have evidence for smaller systems here that this goes disordered. There's a disorder of band, of chaotic bands. They are chaotic because of what we know at the hydrodynamic level, with highly fluctuating, high density pneumatic bands with the order along the band. And you see they're not traveling over like really check bands at all. All right. So the coexistence phase is asymptotically disordered with very large correlation lengths and times. And if you ask yourself, I come back a little bit, uh, if you have a phase diagram, the order disorder transition is actually not here, but here, the second line in this case, because the purple region here is asymptotically disordered. All right. Uh, what else did I want to share? I have a movie about the phase ordering uh, it proceeds by creation of uh, yeah, free branch for dis uh, defects, poisoning, and so on. Here, the correlation length, which is better defined, uh, grows like square root of time. Uh, the correlation functions are in the next slide. Uh, you can collapse them nicely, but they have a short distance behavior that is uh, not, typic not fulfilling uh, so-called Pollard's law. For those of you who are interested, also some interesting stuff here going on. Okay, now the third class, polar particle with pneumatic interactions. How much time do I have? 20? Yeah, it's good. Maybe I go too fast, but anyway. So the third class, so again, the third class, as the title says, it's polar particles and pneumatic interactions. So the particles do not undergo velocity reversals but they align pneumatically, uh, like the microtubules, okay? What happens? It's essentially, I would say, finally, it looks very much like uh, the uh, active pneumatics case with velocity reversals, at least superficially. So here, it's this graph uh, it was published, and uh, it's hard to understand, apparently. Uh, this is the same system <laughs> here, 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 here except that uh, we did not represent all the particles in all these snapshots. So here, increasing the noise at fixed density, we have the same number of particles. Here, we represent only a few so that you are able to see with largish little arrows that you see that, again, pneumatic order is here at, at low noise, but not zero, about 50-50 up and downwards here, okay? And on the other end, at strong noise regime, it's basically locally microscopically disordered. So that's the gas, that's the pneumatic liquid, which has quasi long range order, quasi long range pneumatic order, has also algebraically decaying correlations and also giant number fluctuations, just like in the polar case, with more or less the same scaling exponents. And in between here, uh, given some importance, is the coexistence phase where a pneumatic band high density, high local order has formed spontaneously, leaving outside a gas, 
okay so most of the particles have joined this band and they travel this way or that way and they only tumble due to collisions they don't spontaneously tumble here okay which makes the interface of a band actually a much better defined object than in the previous case where it's constantly branching out it's actually the forward slow business um, in the previous case is the signature that the interface is here in the in the actually in the matrix case of this thing here in the interface I mean in the movie the expensive movie you see it's hard to just define the interface here between the band and the gas because it's highly fluctuating and so on and you can record this by the signature of a two-point correlation function at short distances which is here and well, well very well fitted by something like this okay so in the case where there is no velocity reversals particles travel for one long long time in, in, a, in a given direction one of the two main directions of the pneumatic order the global pneumatic order but they will reverse eventually due to collisions with others okay uh, but nevertheless the band the boundaries of a band are actually well defined numerically speaking at least okay so this is what happens if you are uh, this is at the end of a coexistence region when the liquid fraction so the space occupied by the band is almost one a fraction of space occupied by the band is almost one and here the fraction of space occupied by the band is almost zero so you go continuously from here to here to here here you see that the band is not straight the band is in fact i will show you now is in fact moving like this so again here nothing keeps particle together it's just alignment and because when you align you say next to each other at least half of the time here that these things happen and this feedback mechanism between local order and local density so uh, you know it, it you can see some instability of a band is almost reformed as a straight thing and breaks one apart so asymptotically um, asymptotically if you do very very large systems and you measure the order of the in that sort of regime the uh, global order pneumatic order parameter it decreases like in a disordered phase except that this disordered phase has very large so exponentially defined correlation lengths and times but these are very very large quantities uh, now we know because of what we know at the hydrodynamic level we believe that in fact here where the band is uh, this fickish object uh, it, it looks it's very very steady numerically uh, asymptotically simulating a ridiculously large system i would also see some band chaos of course we cannot see it but we believe yes Sh I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. Olivier, it rings a bell. Uh, the best example I give if somebody presses me for an experimental evidence is uh, uh, some of the recent uh, data on Moti DTSAs again, where both the actomyosin system of Bausch and Company in München and the uh, Oiwa Sano Japanese guys with their motility, uh, their microtubule motility, says they saw spontaneous segregation or into, it's not very clean, but okay, pneumatic order, band, and so on, for some time at least, then it went. Now, um, I will show, yes, tomorrow that uh, we have good reasons to believe at the hydrodynamic level, even deterministic level, that the band solution that we do get from our hydrodynamic equations is always at least in a big check allowed parameter space is always unstable to long wavelength instability so that that's why we are confident that if i were to simulate this on you know ridiculous scales i would see also a band break and band and break and so on yes also yeah although then you would have i'm not sure what you would have actually <laughs> 
Now at, well, we, at hydrodynamic level, it looks like, yeah, you have little holes, which are a little bit elongated to sort of, uh, yeah. Okay, so it looks like the previous case. In fact, we do know now that in the fast reversal case, the active pneumatics uh, that I showed you before, the instability of a band, the long wavelength instability that you see here, and that is also at the hydrodynamic level, is always present also, also in the active pneumatic, active pneumatics case when you have these fast reversals. But there's another instability that dominates this one, and that uh, I will have no time to discuss. But I can, sh uh, you you could see, get an idea of it. Uh, where was it? Before that, sorry, before that. Yes, here. You see here the band has broken into uh, transversely almost, uh, obliquely, but on, on a shot. Uh, it's not a long wave. The band here has undergone some dramatic event and eventually reforms later, but uh, it happened in a very small system compared to the bandwidth, for example. So that means either it's a fluctuation or if it's present at the deterministic level, it is another instability, and indeed there is another instability mechanism possible. Uh, but it's a recent work that we did, and now, it's we, now we know why, and we know that in this particular case of fast reversals, it is this local, fast, oblique breaking of a band that dominates the long wavelength slow thing that's still there, but of course has no time to develop. All right. So if I go back to my rods thing, there's still, beyond these details, uh, some people would say there is something deeper, maybe, that I'll spend some minutes on. It's here. So here you have, what do you have? So you have a giant number of fluctuation plot in the liquid, pneumatic liquid phase. Uh, it has more or less the, so this is the, root mean square, not the variance, more or less the same exponent as in the Vickshack model, uh, more or less the value predicted by Turner 2. Okay. Here is evidence that, well, here's evidence. Well, we're going to discuss this. This is a plot of the global pneumatic order parameter. So I don't want to define it here. It again is suitably, it's the scalar order parameter, suitably rescaled. So it has one is perfect pneumatic order, and zero is full disorder, okay. I, it is as a function of system size in the liquid, everything fixed, just the system size varies. Uh, this decreases with system size. This is a log log plot, okay, up to very large system sizes. And it decreases, you see the scale here, it decreases very slowly and because this is a log-log plot, this decrease is slower than Apollo, which would be a straight line. Or if you insist to put a straight line here, you, you find an exponent of the order of 10 minus 2 or 10 minus 3. Okay. Um, on the other hand, a nice fit of this data, what does it do asymptotically, is this one, where here we have subtracted an in, in a finite number. I have no idea why it's called C0. <coughs> so S here is going asymptotically to this value C0, which is of the order of 0.8 something, uh, as a power law. So the correction to this, uh, the approach to this asymptotic finite number is uh, fairly clean. This is, you know, one, two, three decades here. Okay, now there's a, there's a s so this, if I take this at face value, you know, is a very clean numerics, etc. And I conclude that in this case, this means this is a that you have true long range pneumatic order, okay? Pretty much in the way you have true long range polar order in the Vickshack model, in the, Vickshack, the polar case, with some uh, classically algebraic approach to this. Now, there is a red dashed line here, which is where we should focus now. This is the length scale or the uh, time scale uh, typical of uh, reversals of a m in the in the work of a single particle. So s again, these particles have no intrinsic velocity reversals, but because of collisions, so here they are, you know, 50-50 going this way and that way. And if you follow, if you follow a given one, at some point it will have some 
bad collision with some guys coming in front and we turn around and join the other crowd for some time. If you monitor these flight times or flight distances, particle by particle, you will see that uh, these are distributed exponentially. So there's, there's a well-defined lamb scale time scale. And this lamb scale time scale does not depend on system size, provided the system is largish enough. Which means there is an intrinsic lamb scale time scale in the system, and that's where this red dashed line here. So any anything really convincing numerically should go way beyond this line, you know, another decade or two, <laughs> uh, which uh, is doable these days, but we still haven't found the <laughs> CPU time to do it, but eventually we'll do this, but because we know we this is what we could do at the time. So radio factor, I think uh, six or eight, larger than this. And whatever parameters we have, it's always more or less the same problem anyway. So, but if we, can, if we could add a decade, that would be good. So there, there is a deep theoretical debate about whether this is possible or not. And uh, actually the recent Ramaswamy paper claiming that it's known that we see something that looks like this, that eventually at scales that are probably unreachable these. Okay, but anyway, I would be already happy to see this confirmed uh, significantly away from this red line. Yeah, the thing is, you if you if you are uh, too high density, yeah, no, because uh, if you you need to be safely in the liquid phase. So if you know you don't want to get into the band regime because then uh, you don't want to be too deep in the in the liquid phase because then time scales and these trade-offs basically uh, numerically it's always what you would gain in density uh, by having a shorter lamp scale, you will lose because you're losing an option. So uh, it's like a no free lunch scenario. We looked into this seriously because uh, we, uh, we will do very large simulations, uh, but we want to do it, you know, maybe we gain a factor two, or whatever, but not n no big gain. Okay, so this is still debated. Numerically, uh, my bet is that this, this, this is going to continue and uh, be, uh, you know, undistinguishably flat if we continue. This is uh, the polar order parameter that at the time we were concerned about, global polar order, but it's basically zero, it's really pneumatic order. Um, now, this is where I wanted to stop, but I will add something. I'm not sure now I have to get out of here. I'll show you another experimental system, unless you have questions. I'll show you another experimental system that with bacteria, okay, I don't see anything on this uh, screen. Where is it? I know it's here somewhere. Here. Okay. Okay. All right. So here's an experiment, which I will argue does the same as this last big check rods thing. So polar particles, pneumatic alignment. The problem is, uh, so all these big check things are dry models, obviously, you know. This is about bacteria swimming between two glass plates. Okay, so E. coli, almost standard E. coli cell, except that they are longer than usual, about 10 times longer because they were drugged when growing. So they grow, but they don't divide so much. And you can control this to, to more or less control the length of these bacteria. When when you have white type uh, E. coli, they're too short. They're like little rods, but the aspect ratio is two or three max. And when they bump into each other, there is some degree of alignment, but this does not produce any obvious long range pneumatic order or polar order. If they are longer because they've been drugged, then they do align globally. And that's what you see here. If the density of these uh, bacteria, so they are sandwiched here between two glass plates separated by less than two microns. Uh, the body of E. coli is about 0.8 micron. So they can pass above each other and you see many crossings, you have a good eye. But that's about it, you know. 
at all times it's expected that the flagella bundle or whatever it is is touching both glass plates screening most of the hydro interactions out but indeed at very large densities or large enough densities you see something like this do you, s do you see the global nematic order you see it along the diagonal here I mean from from here I don't see anything because it's just uh <laughs> but okay so uh, we can measure this that's very nice if they have many less bacteria which is something they can do but they cannot control very well the density uh, so they so far they have been unable and they stop doing this but they have been unable to find the right density producing bands but anyway so if we have sparse in there in the gas in the gas so if very sparse you can study what happens between uh, two given bacteria meeting each other first of all you would notice I don't have this data here with me you would notice that you cannot see any deviation from their basically straight wa swim walk at the distance so you have two bacteria which are you know not too far from each other but not touching they go straight and nothing happens basically hydrodynamic interactions are completely screened out they of course on the other hand when they meet they have a fairly high probability of passing through above each other but also a finite probability of actually bumping into each other like the microtubules and then this the statistics of these collisions is also nicely symmetric nematic alignment okay it's weak but it's there um, and that's why you you see here globally you when it moves you see the rather well the global nematic order but if you look carefully there are lots and lots of overlaps and uh, it's not like nicely aligned little rods okay now beyond pictures you can measure things and some of the things uh, we measured is the nematic order parameter or some proxy of this inside sub boxes so here you have a very large system you saw a millimeter by millimeter and of course the system is much larger than this and you so you can measure uh, the local uh, the global <laughs> uh, you can measure the nematic order parameter in boxes of increasing sizes so here is the size of these square domains inside this big field of view okay because we cannot track individual bacteria with so many overlaps and so on we rely on some proxy of order parameter constructing a local tensorial quantity that amounts for very local uh, uh, nematic and then we average over the, the sub area of size s so here is called c the nematic order this proxy for nematic order again it's it's a scalarly a scalar quantity properly rescaled between zero and one in the disordered phase where you have few bacteria not enough to produce any significant nematic order this goes down like one of the square root of s meaning it's a disordered phase with finite coercion length okay in the phase you just saw in the movie these are the red points and in this log log plot you see that it's basically flat if you zoom on this in a still in a log log plot so similar to the rods picture I showed you it decreases indeed slowly okay these points we argue are actually well we know are not statistically reliable this is about the field of view you know um, and if this is n on the reliable point this is nicely fitted again by a going to a finite value as a parallel just like in the Wittschek thing okay of course it suffers from exactly the same caveat that the typical run length of a single bacterium in these conditions is we don't know actually centimeters maybe so we cannot scan experimentally the scales you know over the, the typical tumbling rate tumbling uh, well I take it back in some sense it's it's maybe better here if you f if you were able to follow a single cell you would probably see that it actually joins the other crowd at some reasonably finite rate always very small rate you know, it's just uh, okay so you would have to go to much larger distances to to have a significant statement for the decrease of the order parameter but again for the things we can measure here 
the only uh, the, the coherent uh, fit of the data is going to a finite number as a Paolo with, by the way, more or less the same exponent as in the Wittschek model. Okay, so the debate is on. If anybody ever read seriously the latest uh, Sriram paper discussing this, actually not explicitly discussing this, but related to this. Okay, right. But so numerically, experimentally, uh, this is it. Uh, so this is some kind of interesting case where the obviously things are swimming, so it's a wet system, you would argue. But it's because the flagella of every single cell is are, are touching the walls all the time, so highly confined, uh, we believe most of the hydro interactions are screened. There's no large scale flow because of an emetic uh, order. You don't entrain the fluid in any global way. Um, and it has, this is a signature of charge number fluctuations also there. Okay. We also did measurements of 2.4 relations and they decay algebraically, although this is harder to measure, of course, and so on. So that's an, a very good example of uh, this uh, big check rods. Uh, kind of class where you have polar particles and emetic alignment occurring in, in swimming for swimming <laughs> this confined but swimming uh, cells. Okay, so that's a uh, good time to stop. Uh, tomorrow, I think there's a s there was a slide for tomorrow, but uh, now it's buried both. Tomorrow I will consider how to derive hydrodynamic equations in a systematic and reasonably easy and efficient manner. For the f in general and, in and then in detail for the three classes that we just saw. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? I mean, the this one. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, we so recently, um, my student who just defended his PhD uh, spent an estimated two centuries of CPU on some big uh, Chinese machine to finally measure the two point correlation function uh, of a big check model. You know. And why did we have to go to centuries of CPU? Because, in fact, we quickly discovered that uh, there are there is some crossover scale, which is fairly large, beyond which another scaling regime sets in. Of course, we have no guarantee that this is the ultimate regime. You know, I can already see John Turner say, but then, you know, after three or four changes of regime, we'll, we'll, we should see my, okay. Now, uh, so we, this, this is a measure of a two-point correlation function in its whole glory in with angular resolution. So you can study the anisotropic scaling, along the longitudinal direction, along the transverse direction, in whatever angle, etc. Qualitatively, it fits almost perfectly for the density function, density, density function. We have some disagreement with, even qualitative disagreement with John, but anyway, basically they are right qualitatively. Now, the exponents they defined in their paper, which are the so-called chi exponent, when and this one, when it is negative, you have two long range order, et cetera. And the psi ex exponent, which is the measuring the anisotropy of the scaling, these individual exponents, which is the ones they define from the RG viewpoint, their values are far from the uh, supposedly uh, the predicted 202 values by 50% away. So chi is negative, so there's two long range order, and we knew this already. Uh, but it's very different. It's about 50% different from the predicted value. And Xi is also very different. And by the way, very close to 1, already in 2D, even closer to 1 in 3D, of course. That means that asymptotically, these flux, so but at scales which nobody ever looked at before, are almost isotropic. Okay? Now, the combination of chi and psi, which gives this exponent of the giant number fluctuation, is such that whether you take the tonal two numbers or our, or our new numbers or some intermediate scaling numbers, it's always around 1.6, 1.7, always, always, always. So, you know, there's a combination of exponent which varies by less than 10%, whereas the single exponents or some other exponents you might like to which are sort of the more fundamental in some sense from the RG viewpoint. They are far away 
from the tunnel two predicted values, but the combination of these, making the giant number and the super diffusion actually exponent, which is the same sort of combination by the way, uh, is such that they actually this vary by five eight, five eight percent. No, no, uh, this five or ten percent uh, we know now it's 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 there. It's it's really uh, we we have enough resolution to 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 be reasonably confident that it's fair, but it's it's just that this combination of exponent turns out to be, uh, you know, yeah. In fact, if y if you look at the Tonal two paper, they have uh, they predict 1.6 for in 2D for giant number fluctuations, and 1.53 if I'm correct in 3D, so very close also. Also for 3D, it's more or less the same number over time, and uh, so. So the d factor, uh, the dimension comes in their prediction, and the combination of chi and xi, these two in independent exponents, is such that whatever you do, change the dimension, uh, yeah, it's, it's always, it's almost always there. That's how we understand that everybody who is measuring this. Well, yeah, also, the problem of people measuring just clusters and so on. But if you measure really this, the right things, you always find more or less the same number. So here, you know, given the quality of the data, the system size, it's actually uh, a, a smaller exponent here, but okay. It's, uh <laughs> so um, I'm not sure we have to understand why this combination of exponents doesn't change much. It does change a bit, but it doesn't change much. As a result, because it's the easiest thing you can measure, all available measurements, numerical or what, are always giving more or less the same number, and John can go on claiming that, you know, I know it's not exact, but all numerics tells me that it should be exact. Okay, too bad I'm not going be to be able to show this to him. But you tell him, <laughs> on my part. Anyway, uh, yes, so that's it, yeah.